Hello and welcome to the very first in a series of dental negligence vlogs from the clinical negligence team at Number 5 Chambers. These vlogs are aimed at giving dental negligence lawyers an insight from dental experts as to how they think that lawyers can improve their chances of success and also run their cases more efficiently, thus reducing their costs. Today we're going to be talking about which expert to instruct when running a dental negligence case, be that for either claimant or defendant. My name is Louisa Sherlock and I'm going to be your host for today's vlog. I'm a barrister at Number 5 Chambers and I practised as a dentist for over a decade before becoming a barrister. With me today, I have three dental experts who specialise in different areas of dentistry. Professor Paul Tipton, Dr Madeleine Murray and Dr Lucy Nichols. Uh, dentistry is a unique branch of medicine in that it focuses solely on treatment of disease of the head and neck, particularly the mouth. It's not just about filling teeth and taking teeth out, but also about looking after the soft tissues of the mouth, lips and surrounding areas. Dentistry itself is broken down into various specialities. From my time at the dental hospital, I recall the following specialist areas. Children's dentistry, oral surgery, which involves the extraction of teeth, periodontology, which involves the management of gum disease, prosthodontics, restorative dentistry, which involves the restoration of broken or carious teeth with fillings, veneers, crowns, and bridges, root canal therapy, which involves removing damaged and inflamed nerve tissue and sealing the canal with the material such as gutta perca, orthodontics, which involves straightening teeth, oral pathology, which involves the management of soft tissue disease within the mouth, maxillofacial surgery, which involves some difficult extractions and a general anaesthetic, as well as the removal of oral cancer and reconstruction of the head and neck, and also treating trauma. Sedation, which involves the treatment of dental disease using a sedative in an outpatient clinic. Emergencies, urgent care and radiography. And I recall that there was also um, even a clinic for the management of temporary mandibular joint disorder, which is a discomfort in the jaw joint, um, of which there are various theories as to the cause. In terms of specialisms, dentists can also specialise in, for example, aesthetic dentistry or cosmetic dentistry, trying to obtain the Hollywood smile, for example, um, and also facial aesthetics involving muscle relaxing injections and dermal fillers and so on. So there are therefore um, so many different specialisms that it can be difficult to know which expert to instruct when there is a potential de dental negligence claim. I think it would be helpful first for the experts to introduce themselves and explain a little bit about the areas of dentistry that they specialise in. Um, so starting with Professor Paul Tipton, um, please could you explain a little bit about your dental experience? Sure, thank you uh, Louisa. Um, my name is Professor Paul Tipton as uh, mentioned. Uh, I'm a specialist in prosthodontics, so prosthodontics is involved in uh, I think people call the prosthodontist the architect uh, of the smile, the architect of restorative dentistry, because he's the person that brings many, many different uh, spheres of dentistry together. So the uh, prosthodontist is the person that usually, for a complex case, sees the patient initially, uh, does the initial treatment planning, and then asks the other uh, various specialities to get involved and help. And then usually does the probably the, the end bit of treatment. Um, I'm also a professor of cosmetic and restorative dentistry. Uh, I have an MSc in conservative dentistry. So I'm covering cosmetic dentistry, temporomandibular joint therapy, uh, prosthodontics, crown and bridge work, cosmetic dentistry, uh, a little bit of perio. I don't touch endo or anything like that. Uh, and uh, I've been doing this for, as you can see from the, the, the age of me, quite a long time. Um, I've been an expert witness. I think I did my first uh, legal report in 1986. So I've been doing it for an awful long time. Uh, I probably do about maybe 25, 30 reports a year. So it's not a huge number. Uh, one every 10 days, couple of weeks, something like that. Uh, and uh, I've certainly seen, obviously, the amount of clinical negligence increase uh, over the years. Uh, I also have a training institute, uh, and I tend to do three days a week training and a couple of days a week uh, still seeing patients. So, uh, so that's my setup. Thank you. 
Um, Dr. Lucy Nichols, please could you describe your professional experience? Hello, um, thank you for that. Yes. Um, so after I graduated and did an initial year of vocational training and practice, um, I did a couple of years working in oral surgery. Um, so I had some experience of working in hospital. Um, since then, I've been working in practice. And during that time, um, I've done a master's in cosmetic restorative dentistry. Um, uh, along the way as well, I've done some training in orthodontics um, and provide some um, adult cosmetically focused orthodontic treatment as many general dental practitioners do these days. Um, so um, yes, as a general dentist, I'm involved in a lot of the specialties um, you, you, you mentioned. As, as general dentists, we, we do see children to do treatment on. Um, a lot of us do some orthodontic treatment. Um, of course, we do um, restorative dentistry and prothodontic treatment where, where we're providing crowns and bridges. Um, so, uh, and we do endodontic treatment, which is root canal treatment. Um, and a lot of general dentists um, also provide dental implants as, as I do myself as well. Um, so, so yes, there's, there's lots of different areas that, that general dentistry covers, um, but there are also times where we will need to refer somebody on who has a greater level of expertise in that area. Thank you. Yes, I was going to ask actually if there were any um, areas of specialism that you know you felt that I'd missed, um, and I think that's one, isn't it? Another one, implantology, um, and the is it invisible orthodontics that you do in practice? Primarily, yes. Yeah. And that's more what a sort of a general dental dentist would do, isn't it? So it's simpler cases, um, some orthodontics, but where it's more straightforward and you don't need a more specialist orthodontist with um, it, and using sort of clear aligners or... Clear aligners or, or yeah. tooth coloured fixed braces, yes. but, but generally aimed at um, aligning the front teeth cosmetically rather than trying to correct bite issues, which is more complex. Yes, thank you. Um, and Dr. Madeline Murray, um, would you be happy, please, to describe your professional experience? Yes, so um, I'm Madeline Murray. I've been qualified since 1984, and I'm currently a registered specialist in restorative dentistry. Um, although I now limit my practice to um, periodontics, I currently work in a multi specialist uh, referral practice in Edinburgh, and I um, provide specialist level periodontal care for people who have really severely damaged supporting tissues for their teeth and they're about to have their teeth fallen out, fallen, falling out. My particular interest is very young people who've um, got aggressive forms of disease um, and I also do a lot of work of preparation for patients who are planning implants who've had extensive periodontal disease in the past. Um, in addition to that, I am a senior clinical lecturer in the University of Glasgow, and I teach undergraduates um, periodontology there. I also teach um, postgraduates um, nationally on the dental core trainee scheme, and I also do quite a lot of in-practice teaching for our referral dentists. Um, so that's, yeah, that's me. Thank you. Um, I wanted to know if you could please um, give us some tips on which expert to instruct in a dental negligence claim or what to look for when deciding which expert to instruct. Well, I, I think one of the best places to start is that you need to find somebody um, with similar um, expertise um, and similar qualifications to, to the defendant in the case. So if the defendant is a general dental practitioner, then you're probably going to, to want to instruct a general dental practitioner, certainly to comment on breach of duty, not necessarily to do with causation, because um, that may be more complicated. And depending on what's gone wrong, that's where specialist input may be required. So an example of this would be um, cases of delayed diagnosis of oral cancer. Um, it's, the, it's the responsibility of a general dentist to diagnose suspicious lesions at checkups. Um, but when it comes to causation, the, the, the breach may be that the um, dentist failed to diagnose a suspicious 
lesion and uh, make an appropriate referral on a certain date. And that may have led to a delay in the diagnosis of the cancer of around a year. Um, but what the outcome of the, of the year's delay is, and that's something that it would be more appropriate for uh, an oral and maxillofacial surgeon to comment on. And another example would be um, for cases um, of orthodontic treatment or implant treatment, if the orthodontic treatment has been carried out by a general dentist, um, so if it's a, um, an adult cosmetically focused orthodontic treatment carried out by a general dentist in general dental practice, then you would probably instruct um, a general dentist who works in general dental practice providing adult cosmetically focused orthodontic treatment rather than instructing a specialist orthodontist. Um, and another example would be um, uh, for implant treatment. If it's a, a simple implant case that's been carried out by a general dentist in, in dental practice, then you would want uh, a similarly qualified um, dentist to um, dental expert to comment on that. Um, whereas if it was a uh, more specialist dental implant treatment, then you would need um, uh, more specialist dental experts um, or, or an expert who, who had who had a similar kind of experience or was providing those, those kinds of more advanced implant treatments to be commenting on it. Yes. Can I step in there just a little bit? Yeah. Uh, I, I disagree slightly with Lucy on some of those points uh, in the fact that uh, if I can take it, I, I don't mean, I, I just mean to, 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 infl to, to show a, an example. If you've got a very, very young dentist who has qualified by two years, who's then doing uh, adult orthodontics or doing some Invisalign or something like that, you want somebody a lot more senior to be looking at that rather than another dent young dentist who's been qualified for two years, for instance. So whilst it may be somebody who's in general dental practice, I'd suggest that you need to have a much more senior person in dental, general dental practice who's commenting on what's been uh, happening and the type of treatment rather than somebody of a similar age, similar background, etc. So I'd just like to add that sort of caveat there to Lucy. Yeah, and, and I think that caveat is right. And, and I think that you, you wouldn't really want to instruct anyone as an expert who had less than a minimum of 10 years experience yeah. anyway. Yeah. Yes. I, I, sorry, I would agree as well. I think that it's very valuable to have experience from people who've seen multiple different ways of doing things and can put into context what is happening in that particular situation, rather than somebody who's got, you know, so I, I think that when you're looking for an expert, you want somebody who's got quite broad experience at, you know, that encompasses all sorts of things that might be going on rather than somebody who's very, very focused. Um, so that you get the context of what's happening as well as just the, you know, the very fine detail of it. I think you can kind of start big, go small. Um, yes, yes, I agree with that. And going back to the two examples you gave, so I think the invisible orthodontics, that's where there is a big difference, as we've described, between general dentists who are doing invisible orthodontics for cosmetic purposes and specialist orthodontics in a different a standard of care would be expected of both and I suppose the same with implants but what I'm wondering is if you had a general dentist who perhaps took on too complex a case um, then I suppose in assessing breach it might be initially a general dentist to say well actually this is too complex um, a case in my view to take on but then you might need someone more specialised in that area to then support that would you agree with that or how would you go about determining that? Yeah, I, I think you. Um, it would be um, reasonable to get a general dentist to say, yes, this, this is outside the scope of a general dentist. Um, but to say what, what might have happened had they been referred, then you may need the opinion of the, of the type of specialist that they should have been referred to. I think also that, um, to be fair to specialists to some extent, um, when I'm asked to comment on um, periodontal issues, I'm not judging somebody, somebody in general practices actions on the basis of what I do or what I expect I could do or even what I expect my hygienist in the practice would do. I'm judging on what the standard of care that, that's set out in practice should be and what I would expect you know, a, a finishing undergraduate dentist to be doing in most cases. So um, I think sometimes Certainly, the, some of the cases that I get involved in, um, 
I am challenged about whether I'm the appropriate person to be looking at them. Um, but most, a lot of the time, a general dental practitioner has looked at it already, and then they refer it on to somebody else. But also, I think we are, you know, looking dispassionately at what an accepted level of care is, rather than saying, "Well, you can't do what I can do." Um, so we're, you know, we're not. I don't judge somebody on the basis of what I'm doing. I judge them on the basis of what's standard care in practice. Yeah, I think that's the same. I'd, I'd say the same when you're looking at, uh, at my field of restorative dentistry and uh, uh, crown and bridge work, veneer work, uh, cosmetic work. Uh, it's either up to the sufficient standard or it isn't. And we all know what that standard is. And if there's open margins around, if there's ledges around with cement, it doesn't... Uh, you know, a specialist can comment on that just as easily as a general dentist. We all know the standards of, of what should be happening. So I do agree uh, again uh, with Madeline there that uh, I think a specialist can act as uh, a general practice practitioner. Uh, I spent 15 years in general practice, for instance, before I went on to do my, uh, my extra training. So I've got a good background in specialist practice. I've got a good background in... Uh, in general practice and uh, and some of these things are so basic that yeah. uh, it could be a general dentist or a specialist who, who picks them up yeah i think that's you know i certainly wouldn't be happy to co comment on complex you know endodontics for example but um you know a lot of what happens in perio for instance is that somebody's not recognized that there's any periodontal disease there at all and the patient presents with 70 percent bone loss so you know that's that's not tweaking at the edges as paul says yeah you know I, that's well well away from the standard of care that would be expected and i think we're able to also able to comment on that yeah. okay that's really interesting thank you i think it's worth reviewing here the relevant case law and considering the requisite standard of care firstly there is the bolum test um, in which it was held that page 586 and I quote, where you get a situation which involves the use of some special skill or competence, then the test as to whether there has been negligence or not is not the test of the man on the top of a Clapham omnibus because he has not got this special skill. The test is the standard of the ordinary skilled man exercising and professing to have that special skill. A man need not possess the highest expert skill. It is well established law that it is sufficient if he exercises the ordinary skill of an ordinary competent man exercising that particular art. And at page 587, the real question you have to make up your minds about on each of the three major topics is whether the defendants in acting in the way they did were acting in accordance with a practice of competent respected professional opinion. If you are satisfied that they were acting in accordance with the practice of a competent body of professional opinion, then it would be wrong for you to hold that negligence was established. And further it was said, bear in mind that your task is to see whether in failing to take the action which it is said the defendants should have taken, they have fallen below a standard of practice recognised as proper by a competent, reasonable body of opinion. End quote. Thus, if the defendant can show that he or she acted in accordance with a reasonable body of opinion, this will be a defence to the claim. The word reasonable is important because, of course, a group of dentists might hold beliefs and opinions which are rejected by their peers, for example, because they are outdated or have been disproved. This was considered further in the case of Bolitho, the second case on the slide, and the following quotations are relevant. At page 241, the use of these adjectives, responsible, reasonable and respectable, all show that the court has to be satisfied that the exponents of the body of opinion relied upon can demonstrate that such opinion has a logical basis. In particular, in such cases involving, as they so often do, the weighing of risks against benefits, the judge, before accepting a body of opinion as being responsible, reasonable or respectable, will need to be satisfied that, in forming their views, the experts have directed their minds to the question of comparative risks and benefits and have reached a defensible conclusion on the matter. And at page 243, and I quote, I emphasise that in my view, it will very seldom be right for a judge to reach the conclusion that views genuinely held by a competent medical expert are unreasonable. 
The assessment of medical risks and benefits is a matter of clinical judgment, which a judge would not normally be able to make without expert evidence. As the quotation from Lord Scarman makes clear, it would be wrong to allow such assessment to deteriorate into seeking to persuade the judge to prefer one of two views, both of which are capable of being logically supported. It is only where a judge can be satisfied that the body of expert opinion cannot be logically supported at all, that such opinion will not provide the benchmark by reference to which the defendant's conduct falls to be assessed." End quote. Bearing all that in mind, it is also worth considering the following points. Firstly, a dentist or medical practitioner will typically be judged in accordance with the standard of reasonable competent practitioners of the same rank in the same discipline. Relevant youth and inexperience will not diminish the required standard of skill and care, as set out in the 2017 case of FB suing by her mother and litigation friend and Princess Alexandra Hospital NHS Trust. Thus, a general dental practitioner who is newly qualified will be held to the same standard as a dentist with 20 years of experience. Secondly, where a dentist works in hospital, they will be held to the standard of the post they hold, as set out in the case of Wilshire and Essex Area Health Authority at the Court of Appeal. And thirdly, it's worth bearing in mind that in cases of misdiagnosis, the Bolan test might not be the appropriate test. In the 27 case of Muller, pure treatment cases were distinguished from one of pure diagnosis, where it was said, and I quote, there is no weighing of risks against benefits and no decision to treat or not to treat, just a diagnostic decision which is either right or wrong and either negligent or not negligent. When deciding which expert to instruct then, it is important to instruct an expert with significant experience in the particular field within which the defendant practices. When it comes to a general dental practitioner, it can be more difficult to decide who to instruct. General dentists can vary greatly when it comes to their skill set. Specialists may start their career as a general dental practitioner before later specialising in a particular area, for example, as Professor Paul Tipton did. As soon as dentists qualify, if they decide not to stay on in the hospital, which a small percentage of dentists do, then they go straight out into general practice. This is different to medicine, where upon qualification, medics decide which area to specialise in, and one of those areas is general practice, and a further period of training of around five years is required. After gaining some experience working as a general dentist, dentists can then decide to specialise in a particular area or areas, or alternatively continue to practise as a general dentist. General dentists can also carry out further training in order to carry out work beyond that which they are qualified to do after leaving dental school, but they may not necessarily become a registered specialist. They may become a dentist with a special interest in a particular field. For example, a dentist can carry out further training in order to be able to carry out invisible orthodontic treatment, for example, and indeed I did this in my time as a dentist. As discussed, this is orthodontics which is carried out in order to improve the patient's cosmetic appearance, but not to correct the bite, or occlusion as it's more technically known. Were a patient to require a correction of their occlusion, or were the case to be too complex for a general dentist with further training in orthodontics to be able to take on, then they ought to refer this case on to a specialist in orthodontics. The same is true of implants, in that a dentist can go on a relatively short course and learn how to place an implant, but they wouldn't necessarily be able to take on the cases that a maxillofacial surgeon could. Thus, a potential breach can be where a general dentist takes on a case which is beyond their capability level and it goes wrong. It can be difficult to decide which expert to instruct in cases like these, so it's worth looking into what the defendant's qualifications and further training are first, and also whether they are on any specialist register before deciding which expert to instruct. The experts suggest that for a general dentist, an expert with at least 10 years of experience should be instructed who has a broad experience. And they also suggest that a specialist can comment on the standard of a general dental practitioner for the reasons aforementioned, although the question might be asked 
as to whether they are the right person for the job. Please could you give some examples of where you've been instructed um, incorrectly perhaps and then who should have been instructed instead or situations where you think that perhaps the wrong expert might be instructed for a particular type of case? If I can just take that one up, uh, one of my, my bugbears is that um, TMD work is very often referred to oral surgeons. Just to uh, clarify, TMD, that's um, temporary mandibular joint disorder, which is um, a sort of spray to the jaw joint, isn't it? Discomfort. Um, okay. I, I'm, I'm going into the field of, of certainly a little bit more personal injury and accident work as well, uh, in that um, a huge amount of uh, untreated, undiagnosed TMD is out there from RTAs, for instance, and the general um, solicitor tends to then rely on either a, a medic, uh, a general practitioner, or an orthopedic surgeon uh, who doesn't really understand what's happening at the TMJs, doesn't really go and examine that much. Uh, and if a specialist is required, then it goes to an oral surgeon. Uh, and I'm a great believer in the restorative dentist or the prosthodontist should be the first person that gets to see the patient who's got TMD problems and start to comment on them. Uh, you know, the old adage, surgeons, you go to a surgeon, you get surgery done. And surgery is the last resort. Uh, and uh, I'd like to see an awful lot more of the TMD work referred to restorative dentists uh, and prosthodontists because uh, that's why I feel that they should end up, and if needs be, then on to an oral surgeon at some stage in the future. Yeah, I'd agree with Paul on that point. That seems reasonable. Because that's something that you would try to manage in a different way. Sort of Conservatively. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Uh, rather than going through, through a surgical approach initially to try to treat them with spent therapy, uh, if needs be these days, Botox, things like that, but on a conservative nature. Uh, and we probably know, I'd suggest, more about how to treat the temporal mandibular joints than a surgery uh, or a surgeon with a surgical approach. Is that because they would go to the sort of surgeon at the end stage if you couldn't manage it in any other way? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. If we can't manage it conservatively uh, and obviously go through all of the treatment options, so we get down to now looking at treatment options. Uh, and it's not just going to surgery and it's not just things like a you know, big, huge bugbear of mine is people who say, let's put a soft splint in place. Let's put a, a bike raising appliance in place, uh, which I don't think has got any place in dentistry whatsoever. Uh, and, uh, and so many I see reports where a surgeon said, yeah, patient needs a bike raising appliance. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, because I know there's quite a variety of views on temporary mandibular joint disorder on their theories of how to treat it and that's good to know that it's sort of a starting point prosthodontist or restorative dentist. Yeah. Um, uh, what about you Lucy or Madeline do you have any examples of where you've been instructed incorrectly or where? Well, I, I've, um, I think one of the things <laughs> I'm quite careful about what I will take on. So, so if somebody sends me some instructions, I, I want to know a bit more before I say yes. Um, but I have been asked to, to become involved in um, cases relating to implants, which, so I, I'm trained in using implants, but I don't do it anymore myself. So I'm not really in a position to comment on, on the surgical aspects of implantology anymore. But because I do a lot of work around about implants and with patients who are having implants, I've been approached about that sort of thing. And I think, that, you know, the more information we can get at the initial um, stages when, we're, when somebody wants to instruct us, the better, because then we can see if our experience and our field of expertise actually fits with what's requested. Um, and one of the reports I've just finished doing, actually, I was asked to comment about the likelihood of endodontic treatment being required for some teeth at some point. So I just said, well, I'm happy to comment on this, but not on that, you know, and, and that, I, I think that that's, that's a reasonable way to approach it from my point of view. So I haven't had too many that I've got into and then thought, mm, I'm not the right person for this. Mm. Um, I think it's, if we get the right information at the start, or if we ask for the right information at the start, we should be able to say, I'm sorry, I'm not the right person, but try some you know try this person they might be able to help you yeah i think that uh, that the 
uh, instructing solicitors ought to rely a little bit more on the expert at an early stage and certainly you know, ask their advice. Uh, and you know, we all will have solicitors that refer maybe to ourselves or to one or two experts. They have their, their local expert and to get them involved at a very early stage to say, you know, okay, who's going to be involved in this case? Who would you advise? Uh, and as, as uh, Madeline says, it's, it's very often it's not going to be ourselves, even though we may be, if you look on the, uh, our qualifications, it may look as though we're the right person, but there's far better people um, that we can advise and instruct. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would agree that, that normally I would, I would have a letter of approach and from that letter of approach, I'll be able to determine whether or not I'm the right person if I'm not, I can advise the solicitor appropriately, um, or it may be that I will accept the approach, but that I may feel that in addition to my opinion, they may also need the opinion of, of another specialist, mm -hmm. perhaps, and, and I will suggest that usually at the outset, or, or maybe later when I do the report, if, it, if that doesn't become clear to me until later. Yeah, I think it's not in any of our interests to take on work that puts us out with our area of expertise and then be um, absolutely hammered for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it's interesting, um, Paul's point that, you know, it, it would be good for the solicitor to get in touch and get the expert on board at an early stage. And that's what I was wondering, you know, is that something, for example, the solicitor could um, pick up the phone, describe the case to you and then say, is this appropriate for you? If not, who would you suggest? And would you say that that's a good starting point? Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. You, can, you can iron out lots of things just by having a chat that would take yeah. weeks by email. Yeah. You know, trying to get hold of people, you know, just pick up the phone and say, who do you, you know, do you know somebody? What actually is this all about? Um, yes, I think speaking over the phone, you just can communicate so much more, can't you? And we're going to be talking about um, communication in a later vlog. Yep. In summary then, get your expert on board at an early stage. If you aren't sure who to instruct for a particular case, don't be afraid to pick up the telephone and call an expert that you have worked with before to ask them whether they feel that they are well suited to advise on the case or whether another expert ought to be instructed. An expert might feel confident in drafting an opinion on one part of the treatment, for example, treatment of gum disease, but might then ask that another expert be instructed to advise on another part of treatment, for example, root canal therapy. Thank you. Well, um, Thank you so much, uh, Paul, Lucy and Madeline, for your comments and insights. It's been really interesting to find out more about the various specialities in dentistry and also which expert to instruct. It only remains for me to say thank you very much to everyone for joining us for this vlog and I hope to see you all in the next one. Goodbye from all of us for now. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.